All right, welcome. So um, this is the first lecture of uh, this class, Software Engineering for AI-Enabled Systems. We can talk about the title another time a bit more, why it's so complicated or what the appropriate title would be. Um, before I get started, I we chatted already a little bit and I assume it's working, but I just make sure that everybody can hear me and can find the participation screen and just click the yes button. Just wanna kind of figure out logistics. All right, most people, one or two missing, but let's just go with this. Um, so I already posted this on Canvas before, um, just very briefly before I get started. Um, I want to have this as a class where we can have a lot of discussions. Um, this is the, if you've taken a software engineering class at CMU before, uh, we do this in most of or pretty much all of these classes. The idea is always that it's important to understand trade-offs and there is not a single right answer. So we need to discuss things. So I think this is really kind of being interactive, being able to talk about things, um, ask questions is important. And I don't want to turn this into a class where we just have re pre-recorded lectures, but I want to often have a conversation. I want to discuss cases and so on. So I really am trying, even though we are staying all at home, I'm still trying to kind of simulate an in-class experience to some degree. And so I want to use the following uh, mechanics, which are also, which I also posted before. Right, so Let's use the chat in Zoom uh, for a bunch of things. Um, you can also ask a question just with your voice, that's fine. Um, you can raise your hand if you don't want to interrupt immediately. Um, Shreyans, uh, who's TAing the class, will also monitor the chat and will point out to me things if needed. Um, um, so that's, that's an easy way to have a conversation and I, I might just ask you, um, if you raise your hand to speak up or things like this, or if, if I don't understand things from the chat. Um, it helps if I can see your name, um, you already have your name in there. If you have a preferred name, how you wanna be called, this might help to put it there. Um, I would like you to keep your camera on if you can. Um, so this makes just a better experience. So I can see you, um, you can see each other. Um, this feels much more like actually being together and, and doing something together, um, less isolating. Um, if you can't turn your camera off on, if you want to turn it off for a bit, that's fine. I kind of consider this like if you're stepping out of the room during class or if you're not attending class, that's also fine with me. And if there's any external reason that this is kind of problematic, kind of privacy reasons or something like this, just talk to me and we can work something out. Um, but I would like to set the baseline expectation that we can see each other um, throughout uh, the lectures and assignments. Um, so I would recommend always have the list of participants open so that you can vote for things and have the chat open. Um, if you can have a second monitor, that's probably helpful. The slides are also all online. I tend to post them before class uh, on the webpage. Um, and I might point you to other resources at some point. Uh, if not, that's also going to work, um, but right. So if any of this doesn't work for you, like if you're in an environment where you don't feel comfortable turning on your camera, if you don't want to speak out loud during a session or something like this, uh, just let me know about it. If you can't take the classes live for whatever reason, uh, we can talk about accommodations. Um, Find my mouse again. I, this is a problem with multiple screens though. Um, all right. Um, I mentioned this in the, in the preface a little bit. This is still a somewhat experimental class. This is new. This is the second time I'm teaching this and I'm making quite substantive, substantial changes. Um, so I taught this for the first time in the fall uh, last year, kind of out of an urge we need to teach this, it's kind of an important topic. We need to think about how to design software. Um, we have more and more machine learning components in, in systems. Um, we need to think about 
how do we design those systems? How do we assure those systems? And what can we as software engineers maybe offer? Um, I'm trying to make changes specifically this summer. Um, I'm focusing on much more of a software engineering perspective, assuming that you have more of a background there, teaching a little bit more data science and going quite a bit more into some details like robustness, uh, fairness, um, and um, kind of more specific forms of testing for machine learning. Um, so a little bit more depth than I did in, in the previous class. Um, but again, this is the first, well, this is the second time I'm offering this, but it's still a relatively new class. So expect some hiccups, expect some things um, that may not be ideal, some homeworks that don't quite work as I intended them. Um, and we let's just work through this together. So feel free to give me some feedback. Uh, it's also the, the, the good thing about a relatively new class is that it's flexible. So if there are topics that you would like to see covered, I'm happy to kind of address this, um, things like this. All right. So in terms of framing, uh, a theme that you will see going throughout the entire semester will be that there's this, there are different perspectives on how to build systems with machine learning. And I'm going to simplify a lot and I'm going to explain this more later. Um, but you have the classic software engineering perspective. So people who are building systems, who are thinking about kind of trade-offs, scaling, deploying things, building solutions under constraints. And then you have data scientists who are good at machine learning, at math, statistics, building models, evaluating them. And if you want to build a, a system with a machine learning component, you kind of need both. You need somebody who knows how to build the system, but you also need some experience of actually running, uh, not just building the model, but actually building the entire system, deploying it, making it run. Uh, there's also operations in there, and I'm simplifying here massively. Um, but a theme is that we kind of need both and we need to work together there's kind of this unicorn perception that for a long time people wanted to always hire those people that have both data science and software engineering expertise uh, that really understand both sides well, but those people are relatively rare. Um, people often specialize in one or the other side. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do with this course is give you an idea of what the overlap is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to make you into a full data scientist, but I'm kind of trying to give you the vocabulary, the ideas, the kind of how they are, might be thinking, how you can help them so that you can effectively work together with data scientists, that you understand their language, that you can communicate effectively, that you understand the constraints, but also can support them from a software engineering perspective. And you hear my bias here already in how I'm talking about this. Um, I, I'm coming from a software engineering background and I, expect um, very little data science background from you, actually none. So we're going to teach this from scratch. Um, and I'm going to always be biased a little bit by the software engineering view, um, but I'm trying to give you a perspective of often probably oversimplifying, but how a data scientist might approach this. But um, we're not going to go to a level where we're going to really fine tune deep neural networks and come up with crazy new or in innovative new learning solutions, right? So we want to think about if we work with a data scientist who comes up with these models, how can we integrate them into a system? How can we support them? What do we need to think about? All right, I wanna get into this with a case study. And I wanna start a discussion in a second um, about kind of possible problems. I wanna start with a case study of a transcription service. So this is the kind of thing that as researchers we use from time to time um, where <clears throat> we go out and interview people. For example, we have done interviews with data scientists about how they are developing software and notebooks, right? Um, but also with open source developers and all kinds of things. So you sit down with them for an hour, you talk about things, you have a recorder running. Um, it used to be a physical device, now you record over Skype or something. Um, and then the way that we typically do research is we need to transcribe this, turn the audio recording into text, 
and then analyze this. And there are a bunch of research methods of how you properly analyze text and you can go into kind of the methods, things like grounded theory and so on. And it's not really relevant here. But there's always a step of taking the audio and turning it into text, right? So you have maybe an hour long interview and you need to turn this into text and you have a bunch of these interviews. Um, and transcribing this is really annoying. Like sitting down, listening to the audio that of the interview and typing it, it takes a while. Take, for a one hour interview, it probably takes four or five hours to transcribe it uh, yourself. It's, it's a pretty annoying task, right? Um, PhD students sometimes do it, but rather than paying a PhD student, you can actually ask somebody to transcribe it for you. So you can either hire somebody professional um, or this has been crowdsourced for a long time. So things like this web page here, and I think I have this open actually, um, allow you to do transcriptions um, essentially by uploading, I must grab this two monitor thing is maybe not ideal for me. I had a mouse somewhere, yeah. So this is a service where you can upload an audio file and then they have humans transcribe this. The way that this usually works these days is that they uh, split the audio file into smaller audio files and give it to crowd workers, typically through Mechanical Turk or something like this. Then they integrate this, um, maybe do some quality assurance and, and put this back together. I have no idea about this specific company. And the typical rates that you see is something between a dollar and two dollar per minute to pay for this. Right, so if you have an interview of 60 minutes, maybe that costs you about 60 to hundred dollars to transcribe. And then you have a couple of these interviews, maybe 20, right? So you're paying some money for this. It's, it's not the most expensive part compared to paying a PhD student to transcribe this in their time, but it's, it, it months up to things, right? So this is something that most obviously we can automate. Right, and we have made huge progress in this. So let's assume um, you have done some research. So let's assume the data science perspective. You have done some research, you've built some crazy new machine learning mechanism that can detect kind of voice to speech things with a focus on technical jargon, right? So this could be a PhD um, where Maybe you have taken some public PBS interview data, um, you trained deep neural networks, and you, you did some innovative things that you can actually very well recognize medical jargon or uh, the, the specific vocabulary used in poverty and inequality research or about Ruby programming at conferences. Right, so the things that are kind of hard that are domain specific where you know that these are communities um, that you need to do something special and you found a way to take this big neural network and train it for adapted for these specific terms and communities. And you've shown in some papers that you have much, much better results and kind of the state of the art models that are not trained for these specific communities. Right, and now that you know the market, you know people charge like $60 an hour, $100 an hour. This should be something where you can make money, right? Uh, build this as a service, offer this to academics and maybe also some other markets like conference organizers might wanna do live transcriptions. Zoom in the background might transcribe what I'm saying. YouTube definitely does, right, for videos. So there is a market for kind of these things and there might be a market for something more specialized, right? So let's say we have this research, right? We have built these models and we want to build a service similar to like the crowdsourcing thing where you can go to a web page, you upload something, you pay some money. I wanna start by just thinking about, think about you would do this as a startup. What are the kind of problems that you would expect? And I would like you, I would try, like to try the following. Write an answer in the chat one or two challenges that you can think of, but don't, send, don't press send yet. So instead of sending this, just vote yes that you have typed something. I'm gonna wait until a bunch of you have some ideas. Just think about the scenario. What kind of problems would you anticipate? What's going to be difficult? Um,
So again, don't type yet, um, but just vote yes when you're done. See one yes vote. Is the question too vague or? Yeah, the chat isn't great, I agree. Three yeses. Four, five, eight, nine, one more. All right, press enter. So let's see a couple of things that I can see here um, where things are scrolling. Um, so it's gonna be challenging to do this in real time, right? Give um, quick round uh, return times, um, uh, storage, you may need a lot of storage. Um, finding the right training data, yes. Identifying mistakes that are actually happening. Um, long development cycles, can somebody else develop this much faster to market, right? Um, the barrier to entry seems pretty low, but um, there, there might be a bunch of competition. Honestly, these days, this is actually a pretty big market. There are a bunch of services that are doing this. Um, um, dialects, what else? Um, yeah, dialects, accents, um, non-English languages, all right. So, so a bunch of challenges that we see here. And a lot of things that you mentioned were not directly around the building the model, but about around building a larger service. All right. And again, I want, to, I want you to think about this from two perspectives. So there's a, the, the software engineering perspective um, and the data scientist perspective. And I, let me just, oops. I'll be back in a second. No. All right. I'm going to simplify here, oversimplify, um, but I want to kind of create this contrast of these different two cultures. So if you have um, taken a machine learning course before, this is maybe what you might think of it as a data scientist. So typically you work on a fixed data set. For example, you, get, you download all these PBS interviews, you code them, you learn based on them. And then you focus on getting accuracy as high as possible. Right? So you're trying to build models, you're evaluating. This is what you typically publish things by, right? Achieving slightly better accuracies than somebody else, showing that in this field it works better. There's a lot of prototyping. Often people work in Jupyter notebooks or something similar. And data scientists often really understand these modeling techniques. They understand deep neural networks to the degree possible. Um, and they are experts in feature engineering. Um, and they typically don't really care about how big the model is. They don't really update things much in most courses. Um, so the focus is really, can we improve accuracy on this? And we're going to talk about all of this more if you don't, if, if this seems kind of vague and, um, but the software engineer on the other side, and again, I'm, so, I'm oversimplifying here, but um, these are people who are good at building products, right? So they are typically concerned about cost, performance, stability, release time. Like you have constraints, you want to have a, you have a deadline, you need to release something quickly, right? Um, you want to identify a solution that's good enough to satisfy the customers, but you also don't want to spend arbitrarily 
amount of money on getting a slightly better solution than what the customer really needs. Right? So you need to understand how much quality assurance do you want when you are stopped. They really think about this must scale, right? It must handle large amounts of data, um, need to detect and handle mistakes in some form, needs to maintain this, evolve this, and really run this as a product over a long time, support this, right? Um, and typically focus on things like security, safety, maybe fairness. So what you see here, and again, I'm, I'm making an artificial contrast here, um, but these are people who come at this problem with a different mindset, right? One side tries to solve a modeling problem and get very accurate models, and the other side tries to build, build maintain, and deploy a software product. So I wanna ask again about challenges that you can foresee and now specifically about challenges that you foresee when these two groups work together on this transcription service, right? So you have kind of people with different backgrounds. You have the PhD who has developed the model. They may have hired somebody who needs to actually build the website and deploy it. And again, type, but don't send it yet and vote yes when you have. So what kind of collaboration challenges can you see, can you expect? One yes vote, two. Five. All right, ten. Let's press enter. All right, the disagreement on features, um, communication, uh, trade-off conflicts, um, uh, time taken to build the model versus deployment time, um, different programming languages, different tools, different frameworks, yes. Um, the relative value of accuracy and cost, I think that's an important one. Um, how modular the structure is, um, how, you, how you deal with mistakes, um, different, different in development environments, how do you integrate this, yes. Um, all right, lots of good things. So this is, this is the kind of themes that we're expecting, right? So this is what I want to cover throughout the class. And I don't wanna, um, uh, let's see. So, I think one important theme is that there are many qualities that we care about, right? So the quality is not just how well are the predictions of the model doing, but it's actually, let me just quick back to this, and you don't need to type this time, but um, maybe how quickly can I update my model? How quickly can I answer um, or transcribe the service? To how many customers can I scale? If there are mistakes, how quickly can I detect them? How well can I detect them? How big are my models? How, how well can I update them? Can I train them incrementally? Does training take a week each time? Can I fix things? Can I understand why bugs happen and fix them quicker? Right? So there are all these kind of things that we care about that are not just um, accuracy. Um, and a lot of them are conflicting, right? So the question is really, how do we design a system? How do we um, care about this? How do we um, build this? So I don't wanna go through them, but I have now multiple slides just with questions um, 
that we could ask. What are unacceptable mistakes and how can they be avoided? Is there a safety risk here? Can we debug and fix problems? How quickly? Um, transcriptions sometimes crash. What do we do in this case? Can we achieve high availability? TensorFlow, the framework gets updated. Will our stuff still work? How do we do this? The models are continuously improved, but when should, like somebody is experimenting all the time, when should we deploy? Can we roll back, right? Um, can we handle different accents? Um, can we handle male and female speaker equally? Um, can we handle different domains equally? Um, should we learn from customer data? Can we learn from things that the customer gives us or is this too private, right? Um, is there any chance we might leak customer data to competitors? Um, so lots of problems. There are actually multiple systems that have been built. Um, this, is a, this is a fairly large market these days, I think. Um, one service I have used is Temi. Um, this is a, oops, this was the site that I want. Um, but there are multiple of these. So this is essentially, they have built what we discussed maybe without the domain specific part, although they have competitors that do this specifically for medical services as well. So this is, exactly this kind of thing. You out, upload an audio file, and now you don't wait three days, seven days, but you get a result within 10 minutes or something like this. Instead of one to two dollars per minute, they charge 25 cents per minute. They actually raised their prices since I last checked. Um, when I first saw this, they, they asked for 10 cents a minute, so six dollars an hour instead of a hundred dollars an hour. Um, which hints at another problem here that if you're building these systems, you actually want to build a business, right? So you want accuracy is one thing, but what you really care about is can you make money? How expensive is it to run your infrastructure, to build updates? What's the price point per prediction, per transcription that you can actually support, right? And then you can potentially raise prices or you can lower your cost so where are you in the spectrum? Um, there are lots more lessons. We, we're coming back to Temi uh, later. Um, it's also an interesting lesson about telemetry design, for example, of how do you figure out how well you're doing in production. Um, they have a nice editor. So this is actually what an output looks like. This is when I trans tried to transcribe a podcast earlier, right? So you see the output. It's working very well, actually, um, but it also says that there are certain words that they can't recognize. And you can use this as an editor to fix things. All right. So what I wanted to do to, with this case study, and we're coming back to this later in the class, is uh, just introduce to you kind of the theme of the class that we're trying to think about building products that have a machine learning component, right? So we're not focusing really on how to build the machine learning component, how to do transcriptions better, but how do we build a system, a web service that scales, that has a appropriate quality um, and meets the user's requirements and maybe uh, turns into turns a profit, how do we build a system that has a machine learning component somewhere in it? And the machine learning component can be small or big. Like in, in this transcription service, this is a service that I built around a machine learning component, right? So the machine learning component is kind of central and then I built kind of payment infrastructure and the web end and, and things like this around. But we can also think of systems um, where the machine learning component has a very small part. And that's something very common these days that a lot of companies introduce kind of machine learning components somewhere in their products, either because it's hip or because it actually serves a purpose. Um, for example, Microsoft Office has machine learning in so many different features, things like automatically laying out your slide, things like this, right? Um, so they, they build in Office is not really built around a machine learning component, but they have a lot of them in different parts, right? And again, there is a question, how do you integrate them? How do you build this? How do you deal with this? All right, for the next couple of minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about the class structure. Then I, afterward, I wanna learn a little bit more about you and what you're interested in this class. And then I'm coming back to some content more about what actually changes. So, um, I'm teaching this class. Um, 
I'm an associate professor in software engineering here at CMU, and I've been teaching software engineering for a long time, and I do research in software engineering. Machine learning is not actually my background. I've used it in a bunch of projects here and there, kind of as a tool. Um, but I think we software engineering researchers using machine learning to build better software engineering tools are not really representative. Like software engineering researchers build better auto completion tool or duplicate bug detection tools or things like this, right? So issue reports, things like this. Um, these are often not the kind of production tools that I'm really interested in, right? So code completion or so, yes, we use machine learning in all of these things, but what, what I really care about is building products for end users and, and how to build those. Um, so my background and most of my research is more kind of in quality assurance and analysis, but I'm interested in kind of understanding better of how we build AI systems. We're starting a little bit of research these days on kind of notebooks and transitioning things into practice. Um, I think I understand machine learning well enough to kind of have an outsider's perspective and teach the ideas, um, but I won't be able to answer kind of very detailed questions on machine learning. Uh, Shreyan is uh, helping in this class as a TA. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Shreyans. I'm a master, uh, master's in software engineering student. Uh, I took this course uh, last fall and uh, I quite enjoyed it because I worked as a site reliability engineer at a startup back uh, in the day and we had a lot of problems uh, regarding uh, machine learning engineers spinning up, uh, you know, AI systems and uh, provisioning issues and just general uh, uh, issues on how software engineering practices change when you're handling uh, intelligent components, uh, uh, you know, in companies. So I think it's a pretty useful course. Uh, I definitely recommend you uh, go through the readings uh, that are prescribed. Uh, I found I found them very useful and uh, very uh, interesting. A lot of them are, you know, describing state of the art uh, uh, advances in the field. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the class and feel free to reach out to me in case you have any questions. Right. So I think most of this is fairly standard. Um, if there are any questions, if you have concerns, either post on Canvas or send us an email. Um, we're not offering fixed office hours, but we are approachable. The easiest way to do this is um, I tend to stick around after class for at least half an hour. So if you have any questions, just approach me after class. But if there's any, and I think Shreyans as well after recitation. Um, and if there's anything else you want a separate meeting, um, also just email me and, and we'll find a time. Um, the, also feel free to just ask questions publicly on Canvas if you think this is useful for others as well, uh, or ask them during class. Um, all materials in this class are on GitHub. Um, these slides look a little bit weird because I created them with kind of some markdown hacky thing. Uh, so it's relatively easy to kind of fork a project, merge things, um, look at different um, slides. Um, so if you have any ideas, feel free to send a pull request, including pull requests to assignments. Um, I might not accept the ones that are just taking out all the deliverables, but uh, maybe you have some ideas of how to improve parts of this class. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I have a software engineering background and I teach this like a software engineering class. So we focus a lot kind of on engineering judgment, looking at trade-offs, looking at, um, we could do this or this. There's no obviously one correct answer. It depends. There's this running joke in the software engineering master program that it always depends, right? The answer is always it depends. Um, the problem is just that if you answer it depends, the next question will be what does it depend on and what kind of decision would you make in this specific scenario, right? So we, um, a good software engineer can understand the trade-offs and make a judgment call and justify this, right? It's not just a pro, we, we see software engineering as quite different from just a programmer, right? It's somebody who really understands things about um, trade-offs, alternatives, um, design. So I'm trying to also make this fairly practical. Um, so there will be a number of assignments um, 
going to talk about them in a minute. Um, some with a more of a discussion flavor and requirements flavor and, uh, and a bunch of them that have more engineering focus. There will be, um, we're building systems, we're testing systems, we're automating solutions, and there will be a strong teamwork component in the second half of the semester. Uh, we will not focus on formal guarantees or on, oh, I will focus on some machine learning, but not go very deep. So I don't, you don't need a lot of statistics background, for example, to, to come through this class. Um, so this is where prerequisites are always kind of challenging, right? So for the summer, I decided that I, I don't want to go too much into software engineering. So I assume that you have at least a basic understanding of software engineering and some experience building some systems that are more than 100 lines of code, right? So not just the small cl class projects. And I assume you know things like version control, how to gather requirements, a little bit of software design and modeling, <coughs> some testing and test automation. Hopefully you have seen some continuous integration in some form. Um, maybe I've worked on some larger projects, uh, software projects where you had some teams, right? Not just homework on your own. And if you kind of, if you want to see a little bit more about this, there's a uh, quiz, an ungraded quiz on Canvas that uh, asks you a bunch of questions and answers in a couple of, um, like once you submit this, there are a couple of answers to kind of say what I would have expected for those answers. This is for you to assess whether this matches kind of our expectations um, and feel free, let's discuss if, if you feel this is not the right approach. So we don't expect any machine learning background in this class. I will cover this, um, especially this in next week. This might be a little bit boring for those who have taken a machine learning class, who have some experience there, but I'm trying to give you some understanding that's sufficient to kind of get an idea of how does it work internally? How do I need to interpret this? How should I think about this? Um, if your background is opposite, um, like if you have taken a bunch of machine learning classes but don't feel too familiar with software engineering, I would recommend to take the fall version where I wanna swap the uh, prereqs, where I don't wanna teach the basics of machine learning um, and AI, but I, I will, start much more at a much lower level on software engineering. Um, again, if you have any questions, let me know um, and I'm happy to talk about this. So you've seen this already. Uh, I want to keep the lecture somewhat active. I, I ask you questions from time to time. I want to have some discussions. If you have some experience, um, I'm always happy for you to contribute them um, in a more or less formal way as you want. Um, we have some in-class exercises, um, some presentations, but probably mainly just one project presentation at the end. Um, there's a textbook um, that I'm going to assign actually most chapters of as readings at some point. Um, it's fairly high level. It's a lot like a lot of other software engineering textbook, but it has a heart in the right place. And it has, I think a very, good high level description, thinking with the right mindset about building entire systems. Um, so we are going to go through this. And in addition, I'm, I'm going to recommend a bunch of articles, papers, books, uh, podcasts, and so on. The book is available through the library. Um, so with the VPN through the library, you can access the book for free. Um, there's also an audiobook version of this which is maybe not the most engaging for this kind of book, but feel free. Um, there will be reading quizzes before every class. So I'm going to assign kind of a reading. Um, I want you to look at it. It's hopefully the quizzes are supposed to be short and easy. They're more a trigger for kind of showing, have a look at this. Um, some of the readings you might want to pay closer attention, some you might be able to skim depending on uh, what you're familiar with, what seems easy or interesting. Um, it's often background material that helps to understand parts in the class. Um, yeah, I would encourage to look at this. I know that um, most quizzes you can answer with a very superficial look at the readings and if that's what you want to do, that's probably also fine. They are always due before the start of the lecture. Then I can 
talk a little bit about assignments. Um, so I think we have a fairly reasonable plan about what we want to do this summer. Um, so there are a couple of small to medium sized individual assignments. Um, they're mostly in the first half. And then there's one larger team project that has multiple milestones. So think of this either as multiple projects or as one larger project, mostly in the second half. Um, the, I have a rough schedule on the web page. Um, the assignments are due mo mostly on Tuesdays, uh, midnight. Um, the first one is next week, a case study where you look at a paper and kind of reflect on kind of building a system in production. Uh, the second assignment will be you going out to gather some data and model a specific task. So this is some machine learning practice to warm up with some of this. Um, again, not expecting any background. Um, um, then we're looking at, at trying different machine learning techniques and the different qualities that they have. So it's a little bit more modeling, but more from a software engineering perspective and actually measuring things. We, we're going to have an assignment on requirements and architecture. And then um, one on tools where I would ask you to look at some open source tools and report back to the class um, and one on fairness. And the quality assurance projects are things um, where you're going to build a prediction model that's running kind of in production. So we have a Netflix-like service um, where a million users are watching movies every day or every other day, and you're building a, re a recommendation service for this. Um, we're actually simulating um, the users so that you can actually have an impact. Right? So you're making a recommendation and maybe the users are watching those movies or they are not. Um, the recommendation service is something that we actually want to deploy um, that should actually run in a somewhat stable fashion. It needs to be able to deal with a million of a million users a day. Um, it needs to be able, possible to update this, to test the quality of this. And we'll talk about a lot of this. So the team project is mostly around quality assurance, kind of testing and production, building and deploying a service. Um, and this will go over multiple weeks in a team of four to six students. Um, we have recitations. Um, the first one is tomorrow. Um, recitations are typically hands-on exercises that often prepare for some of the assignments. Tomorrow we will start with an introduction to Apache Kafka, which is a streaming service that you use in the second assignment and also in the later group work. Um, so this is, I think, an interesting kind of technical way getting into this and understanding kind of a, um, a streaming, stream processing framework that's broadly used in production. Um, and then the week after we're doing some machine learning um, frameworks. Right, and uh, if any of you have any ideas about uh, things you want to learn related to the course and have some ideas for recitations, uh, please feel free to forward them to me and uh, we can make an effort to incorporate that. Yep. All right. Um, grading is, I think, fairly usual. Um, we have a midterm, but I decided not to have a final during a kind of working from or studying from home because it's kind of weird. So I'd rather have project presentations at the end um, of this quality assurance project. Um, there is a participation component. As I said, I want to have discussions in class. Um, I want to value you participating in discussions and <clears throat> give you a little bit of credit for that. Um, so um, we're taking track um, of who's participating, like when I ask you to write something in the chat or who asks questions in class, um, who participates in discussion, also in recitation. Um, and we're grading this as well, um, it's 10% of the grade. And we don't want to, so participation is not attendance. It's not just being there with or without the video. Um, I really want you to participate in discussions actively. It doesn't have to be every single lecture, but on average um, kind of want to see participation. Um, people always ask this, we have a late day policy for individual assignments. You can be up to three days late with a 10% penalty each day. Um, we also, it's not written down, but if you submit like five minutes late, don't worry about it, but don't be like an hour late. Um, 
for group projects, for each milestone, we don't have a late day policy, but in general, talk to us if you have any concerns, if you want an extension for any reasons. These are not, these are not normal times, right? Uh, studying from home is not normal. Teamwork from home is not normal. We're going to try to be as flexible as we can uh, in accommodating you. Um, just talk to us. And I need to talk about this, even though I think it's, it's obvious, but please don't cheat. It's very painful for everybody involved, both for the person cheating and for me talking to the person cheating. Um, um, I know most of you don't consider cheating. The, the, the place where people make stupid mistakes are when it's kind of close to the deadline and they're panicking and they want to get something in. If you're panicking, you're not making smart decisions. Um, you're not cheating well. This is stuff that might be detected. Again, this is painful for all of us. So if you're stressed or overwhelmed, if you're panicking before a deadline, rather than cheat, talk to me. Right? This is always strictly better than cheating. Um, and I hope I don't need to say more about this. Um, Right, so in the course, I need to update this at some point, but we're, we're going more or less through all phases of a, of a typical software engineering life cycle, not necessarily in order, but we're covering topics of most of these things. Um, the way that I structure the class right now is that in the first two weeks, we cover a bit more machine learning basics. Then we're talking about kind of requirements and architecture and uh, quality assurance, and then the the second half of the class, we talk about specific qualities, especially fairness, um, robustness, uh, safety, um, interpretability, debugging, things like this, right? So the second half, when we talk about those qualities is often a little bit more researchy than the first or closer to where current research is. Um, but I hope that all these parts are interesting. Um, and just as a, I think this is my last slide on this. Um, the, we have AI in the title um, and I talk more about the difference. Um, AI is kind of this big umbrella term um, where machine learning is one part of. We will mostly focus on machine learning in this class. So kind of vanilla supervised learning. We will talk about other things a little bit. We will talk a little bit about probabilistic reasoning, expert systems. Um, AI components where you can actually give proofs. Um, and we talk about the span of different AI, um, machine learning and AI techniques, but I think for the most part, we, we default to thinking about fairly straightforward um, machine learning techniques. Um, are there any questions about the syllabus? About what we're covering? about the course mechanics? Raise your hand or write in the chat. All right, there's one more thing. Um, since I'm teaching online anyway, and we're recording all of this, I was thinking about publishing the lectures, the recordings, after taking out webcam footage and some discussions um, for privacy. So, however, I will only do this. So I think this is kind of an easy way to do. I want to publish, uh, promote the class, also teach it uh, this is also why I created everything in Markdown that other people at other universities can copy this. And I feel having also re uh, recorded slides might be useful in this context, but I'm only going to do this if you, um, if you consent to this. If you feel uncomfortable, even just vaguely, I'm fine with not doing this. Um, I would like to see just in terms of kind of yes, no, uh, whether you're comfortable with recording this. And also, if you're not comfortable saying no here, send me an email afterward. I'm, I'm listening to this as well. All right. Um, 
I'm running out of time. I was actually planning to do one more topic to think about specifications. And I think I'm just going to do this in two minutes just to pitch this idea and then going to complete this um, on Thursday. Um, this is one of those things where, this is I think one of the fundamental changes um, between kind of classic software engineering and machine learning. As classic software engineers, we're typically trained to think in terms of interfaces. Um, they help us to assign blames. So we have often textual descriptions that say what the method should do. And then we can evaluate given certain inputs, does the method actually do what, we're, what it's supposed to do, right? So if an algorithm returns array out of bounds, that might be perfectly okay because it might be what the algorithm is supposed to do if these things in the graph are not connected. Right, so as software engineers, we are often trained to think in terms of oops, um, actual specifications. So we have this often in API documentation that very clearly says what the API should do. And then if the API doesn't behave like we're expecting it to do and like what the specification says, then we're talking of a bug, right? So the software is buggy, but to claim that it's buggy, we actually say that it behaves different than specified. And instead of specification, we might also say requirements or, or something like this. This can be in different degrees of formality, but the problem is um, when we come to machine learning, what do we write as a specification, right? The entire idea of a specification breaks down. We can't say what it means to transcribe an audio file or what it means to suggest what things to purchase on Amazon, right? We don't know how to actually implement this suggestion mechanism. Um, otherwise, we would just write it down as an algorithm with if else steps, right? Um, or predicting whether somebody will commit another crime, right? So these are things that we tend to try to do with machine learning, but we don't tend to have a real specification. And that's because we use machine learning exactly in those cases where we don't have specifications, where we can't come up with them, either because we don't know them or because they're too complex for us to understand, right? So we can't write down all the reasons that we think of, um, like in res recidivism, like whether somebody is going to commit a crime again, uh, we simply don't know, right? We can observe what happens in practice, but we don't know. And if we're thinking about language audio transcription, maybe we could figure this out. If the wave goes like this and this, then it should be this word. But this is so complicated that we never would actually specify and hand code this, right? So those are the parts uh, where we use machine learning. And now we have, a, we have a huge difference. We have these systems that are actually, that don't have specifications. They have vague goals, right? So they say, predict as best as you can on this data or fit this data in some, some nice way. And that makes things really hard to um, test. So, thinking about what does it even mean to have a bug in a machine learning component is kind of weird. If a machine learning component predicts the wrong word in an audio transcription, is this a bug, right? So what's the equivalent here? So a bunch of things break down. You can think about this and go through this later. Um, but this really changes how we think about systems. We don't have clear specifications. We often do best effort things. We kind of deal with mistakes. Um, and this has a lot of changes about how we think about designing systems. And I don't wanna go over, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this next time. Um, last thing, there is a quiz on Canvas that I would like you to answer today. It's another ungraded quiz. It overlaps a little bit what you said live here in, in class, um, but it helps me again to tailor the course and kind of see your background and understand a little bit uh, better of how to do this. So with this, let me just, stop here and then continue on, on Thursday. What I try to do today beyond kind of just saying how the course mechanics work is that data scientists and software engineers are different roles that often have a different focus and different goals. And we often need both if we want to build actual systems, right? If we actually want to deploy and maintain something. And there are lots of qualities that are relevant, not just accuracy. And to just briefly finish up this, um, part on specification next time. And then the next two lectures will be background on kind of machine learning, how to think about this, some of the basics, and then also a little bit on symbolic AI and kind of deep, uh, deep learning um, next week um, that we kind of have a shared understanding of what we're talking about. 
So that's all I have. Um, I'm gonna stop recording at this point and then I'm just gonna stick around for questions that you may have and so on. So thanks.